All right, welcome to the production phase video, uh, which fits into the Folio Explain series that we've been developing to help you understand how to attack each aspect of the Folio. In this video, we're going to be spending quite a lot of time looking at the safety aspects that fall within record of production and the production phase. Um, specifically, probably coming across the terms risk assessment, SOP and risk matrix, probably the three most technical bits of language here. We're going to give you a demonstration of what a record of production actually looks like, the link between safety plan and workshop practices, and by the end of it, hopefully you can do your risk assessment, know how to document your on-grad training and actually get your record of production happening. As we start with the safety aspect, because this comes first in terms of the folio, probably give you a quick overview here. There are two main laws that we are following here, okay, the legislative requirements. That is the Work Health and Safety Act 2011 and the Work Health and Safety Regulation 2017. Both New South Wales legislation, they have their counterparts across all the different states and territories in Australia, uh, but we're obviously referring to the New South Wales versions here. The fundamental principles within these bits of legislation are, number one, you have a responsibility to work safely, and number two, you have the right to be in an environment that is safe for you to work in. They're the fundamental principles of the law. Then in addition to that at school, you also have to follow all of the reasonable directions from your class teacher. So that's, what, that's the sort of the guidelines that we're working under. We want you to be safe. In exchange, we're going to do everything we can to keep you safe. And that means following the request from your teacher about being safe. So there's, there's three, three key ports there. The goal is that by the end of every lesson, no one should be injured and certainly no one should die. That's how the legislation is built. Trying to avoid death and injury wherever possible. We do that through a process of assessing risks where we look at what sorts of things could go wrong What's the consequence of those things? And then how likely are those things to happen? So we use this thing called the risk matrix. You can see it up on the screen, it's got some colors and some numbers. First thing is, number one is the worst. Red is the worst. Green is good, or green is the best, I should say. And number six is the best number. Think about any activity that happens in the workshop and you should be able to apply the risk matrix. So I'll get you started. We're using a tenon soaring class today. So we start with consequence. How severely could using a tenon saw hurt someone? And we start at the top and work our way down. Could it cause permanent disability or death? Not likely. Could it cause long-term illness or serious injury? Not likely. Could it cause medical attention and several days off work? Not likely. First aid needed? Yes, um, I teach timber. I see this. Students cut themselves every now and then with the sharp bits of the back of the tenon saw from not holding it correctly or having their fingers slightly in the wrong position. Okay, so I'm gonna say, in this scenario, Let's run with first aid needed is the consequence of something going wrong with a tenon saw. Maybe you need a band-aid, maybe you temporarily need a bandage or something like that. Even that's unlikely. Let's, let's stick with just a band-aid. Okay, we've got a small scratch. Then, once we've decided the potential consequence, we then look at what's the likelihood. So, what is the chance or the likelihood that someone is going to need first aid, first aid as a result of using the tenon saw. And so we have the option of could happen at any time, could happen at some time, could happen but rarely, or very unlikely, it could happen but it probably won't. I'm gonna say this is unlikely. If you're using the saw correctly and it's stored correctly, it's unlikely that you're going to need first aid. So then we get a score of five. Now five is not the best score, six is the best score. So then we have to think about how do we make it safer? 
what could we do to make it even less likely that someone is going to get injured from using the tennis saw? And this process of us thinking about the possible consequences and the likelihood of them occurring is what we call the risk assessment. Now the risk assessment falls into a table like this. We give you this scaffold and we encourage you to use it. And the idea is that we might fill in multiple rows. It should be one row for each of the processes that you are going to use throughout the production of your product. So if I'm thinking about making our serving trays, to use the serving tray, we had to use the trimmer router. So in the first column, the work step, we describe the process. We're gonna use the trimmer router to cut a housing into the sides of the carcass for the shelf. And then we say, okay, what are the possible hazards? What are the things that might happen during this step? And I've said, well, there's two things that I can think about. Possible that there's a spinning blade, or sorry, there's definitely a spinning blade. It's possible that someone might have some loose clothing, maybe even a necklace, maybe a bracelet, something loose that gets caught in the spinning blade. And then what could go wrong here is, well, that could cause the blade to tangle and cause injury to a person. The second thing that I can see going wrong here is that in the guard, there's a small hole, okay, and that's where the airflow goes. And it's very possible that if fingers get into that guarded air, that uh, area while the blade is spinning, that there could be damage to the fingertips. So then we, we do our risk rating. We go back to this table and say, how likely is it? And what's the possible consequence? And I've said, well, look, this could be a long-term or serious injury, but it's unlikely to happen. So I've said that this is a level three. And obviously we wanna make it safer than three. So we have to do something to try and reduce the chance of injury. And this is where the hazard controls fit in. So to try and stop loose clothing from getting caught, we're gonna encourage everyone to wear an apron to restrict their loose fitting clothing and make sure that the straps are tied behind the user. Because if you tie the straps at the front, then that's loose fitting clothing that's also gonna get stuck in the blade. The second thing we're gonna do is that the teacher has to provide a demonstration on how to use this tool safely. And they're specifically going to highlight to the class what would happen if your fingers were in the wrong position and fell into the cutting zone. Now between these two things, we then say, what's the revised risk level? And our goal is to get to a six, okay? But if we have a look at it this way, if we have an apron on, then no loose clothing can get caught anymore. So it's very unlikely that anything could happen. And even if it did, even if the router did get caught in the apron, because there's the apron there first, before the clothing, before the person's skin, it's very unlikely there'd be any real damage. Okay? So we're saying it's unlikely. And the second aspect that we spoke about was fingertips going into the blade. Now, if we said, okay, well, the possibility is that that's going to be some medical attention or first aid possibly, but it's very unlikely it's gonna happen anyway, that's when we could possibly move ourselves to the six. And the last column is who is responsible for each of the things that we said we were gonna do, these controls. The student's responsible for wearing the apron correctly and the teacher is responsible for reminding the students to wear their apron correctly, okay, and, and constantly challenging them and asking them why they're not wearing it properly, but also for providing the demonstration on the safe use of the tool. And so we do this for each of the dangerous processes and then ideally, when you go into the workshop, you will know all of the things that you need to do, the controls that need to be put in place to stop you from getting injured or reduce that chance of injury. The second step within safety is safe operating procedures, what we call SOPs, SOPs. 
every single tool and machinery that we have in the workshop has an SOP document created. We've got those usually up on the wall behind the machines and then usually on the box of the actual tool if it's a portable power tool. If not, on the wall next to it in the tool store. These indicate the procedures that you need to follow as a user to reduce the chance of injury when using these tools. It also talks about what PPE is required, what you need to do before starting the machine, and what the possible risks and hazards are when using this machine. What we want is we want a photo or a copy of each of the SOPs for all of the tools that you have used in your project in your folio. Now you can screenshot them and shrink them to fit so you can have six or seven or eight to a page, that's no problem. But we wanna see, see at the top there we've got safe operating procedure bandsaw. We wanna see one of those for each of the tools that you've used okay, to show that you are aware of these SOPs or these safe operating procedures. Now, you can go around the workshops and take photos of these and put them in. Or, you can see there's a little link there. If you type that link into your computer, that'll take you to a folder that has a copy of them all. Now, just a reminder, you'll need to sign into your uh, Google account to get access to these. Okay, but that is all set up for you. The next aspect of safety in the folio is the record of you having done your safety tests. And so I've logged into OnGuard as a sample student. And you can see here that when I go into my course, I've got all the tools there and all the machines and all the processes that I need to do tests for. And I've got that big red not complete. That's no good. I need that to say complete for every single tool and machine that I've got on my OnGuard screen. Okay. So if I'm in 9Tech3, I'd go to 9Tech3's course and make sure that they say complete on every single tool that's assigned. Once you've done that, we want you to take a screenshot, copy that into your folio as well. And okay? that's even more evidence of the safety that you have followed throughout the production processes of your project. The very last aspect of safety is in the record of production. When we do the record of production, we record what are the processes that we followed to actually produce the product. So what we do is we ask you to put a photo of each of the steps and a little description. So you can see here, this student here is cutting the base pieces to general length on the drop saw. So that's just the process that they've followed. Then the students included a column called safety and they've written down all of the safety considerations that they have followed. Things like wearing PPE, like the earmuffs, eye protection, dust extraction, hands away from the blade, all of those sorts of things. And then they've used arrows to highlight how their hands are not near the blade, how they've got the dust extractor connected, how they've got their earmuffs on. All of those things help to show even more safety. While we're at the record of production, we also encourage you to put in a difficulty scale to talk about how difficult each step was. What was difficult about it? Why was it difficult? What things went wrong? What things went well? And to work out that difficulty, use a green, yellow, and red scale to help you highlight which things were hard and which things were easy. Remember, one of the things that we look at, particularly at those HSC level projects, is how difficult was it to make your project and so if you've got lots of red difficult things in, then it shows to the marker that you think your project was pretty difficult. And if they agree with you, that's cause for some good quality marks. Throughout the production of your project, you also will run into problems. This is normal. And I cannot say this more clearly. Things go wrong all the time. You're working with a natural product. Timber is filled with defects. There are lots of things that can go wrong. It could also be that you're a human. Things go wrong. Sometimes we measure things wrong. 
Sometimes we drop things and dent them or crack them and chip them. Maybe we're not very accurate. Maybe the chisel slipped a little bit. There's a few things that can go wrong and it's normal to have things go wrong. I get really worried when I read folios and this section is blank because I'm yet to come across anyone, including myself, that has not made a mistake along the project and had to come up with a solution along the way. In fact, your ability to solve these problems is a strength and there are marks available for you showing us how you have solved the problems that you come across because they show great skill. To put it in a folio, it's really simple. It's a table where you write down what are the problems and describe those problems. Then you describe the solution. How did you fix it? And then provide an image or a couple of images that highlight it. In this particular sample, the student had a problem where they glued their project together. They did their, their widening joint, so their domino joint widening. But then the timber bowed after they'd glued it. And that happens all the time. There's not much you can do about it. Timber's natural. It constantly is absorbing moisture from out of the air or drying out even further. And as it meets that equilibrium moisture content, it changes shape. It happens. I'm really sorry, but it's natural. So how do we solve the problem of the bowed timber? Well, you could sand it, you could put it through the thicknesser and take the bow out, but the more you do those things, the thinner your project gets, the thinner that timber becomes because you have to keep sanding timber away every time it changes shape till it's flat again. So what this student did was said, well, look, it's going to keep bowing and I don't want to make the timber thinner. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the bottom of my project hang over by about seven millimeters. Okay, we call this an overhang. By doing that, it's hidden the bow. And if you look along that line there, it was these side pieces, that, that big bit running up and down, that was actually bowed. And because of the overhang, you can't actually see how bad the bow was. But if you tried to bring it all the way to the edge and have a nice neat finished edge, you definitely would be able to see it. And it would be very obvious, and then it would look like a defect. By putting this overhang in, it's hidden the defect and means that the client is less likely to be upset. And that there is evidence to solutions of problems. So if we go back to our original criteria for this succession, uh, this is the production phase. We've ticked off the safety requirements and how we complete those in the production phase. We've ticked off the record of production, how safety fits into that as well. And the last aspect here is the evidence of solutions to problems. From this point forward, your folio is complete. The last thing that you need to add in is your final evaluation. And so I look forward to seeing you in the next video where we discuss that. Thanks.